so thank you, Lord Williams, uh, Rowan, as you said I may call you today, thank you uh, for making the time for this uh, as part of a series of interviews. Um, the first thing I wanted to ask you is, um, if I can be a, a little, um, asking about Wales. I have been to Swansea. I understand your parents. I, I have two best friends, Jerry and Marion, and I go to Swansea for only one purpose, to ride a motorbike around around the, the Brecon, uh, Brecon Beacons. Um, and they live in a place that no matter how many times I go to it, I still cannot pronounce it. Mm -hmm. uh, Istrig Inglas and I've Astrid, probably Astrid Gunlice. Astrid Gunlice. Yes. Thank you. And I will still uh, destroy <laughs> destroy that. So I know that part of the world. I understand your parents. Um, were they born there or lived there? Um, I know well, they were native there, and that's where I actually spent my first few years. Fantastic. So I um, can basically a, like you know, a mining village in the Upper Swansea Valley. Mm. Thank you. So that lets me situate you um, in your uh, childhood. So um, could you tell us what Swansea was like in the 1950s? Well, um, possibly the 1960s rather more, because as I say, I spent my first few years in Nostrad Gunlice in the village. Then we had a few years in Cardiff, and then I had my teenage years in Swansea. I thought Swansea was a, a really, really lively place to grow up. I was lucky in being a very... Um, very good school. It was just a sort of basic um, Welsh urban grammar school, but um, excellent teaching. There was a huge variety of stuff going on around um, in terms of drama and music. And also there was quite a strong United Nations Association in Swansea, and they organised annual events and conferences for young people. So certainly when, when I was a teenager, that was part of part of the map. And one thing that impacted quite considerably was when I was, um, I suppose, about 17, my um, first year in the sixth form, would it be? And we had a, a residential conference, a two-week conference in North Wales, organised by the United Nations Association, on, on global problems, essentially. And that, that was an extraordinary experience, not only meeting... Um, other people of my generation from around Wales, but also young people from around the world, and having speakers talking to us about, for example, about Latin America, about the uh, South African situation. Um, we had an extremely vigorous evening with somebody from the South African Embassy, I remember, who um, I think eventually re retired, bruised his corner. Um, we even had a, a student from China. So that was that was a hmm, bit of a watershed moment in learning about the world and its issues. So yes, a lot going on in Swansea. I felt it was a, a real a real city. Plenty of um, corporate activity and energy and intelligence. It's interesting. I'm from Luton. Um, I grew up literally next door, well just round the corner from the mosque that was built there. Mm. And I remember the disturbance that that caused locally uh, mm. when it was built. And then um, obviously Luton has changed considerably as a modern you know post second world war town my parent my grandparents and above were all coal miners were involved in coal mining and mm -hmm. escaped the brutality um of that after the second world war um and were sort of recruited down to this uh new new town well old town as it was and it's uh it's interesting that sort of ferment through the 1960s mm -hmm. that i saw there well i was born there in the 90s but um to go back to it today and see how it still has some of those you know historical things in place but is is changing beyond recognition mm -hmm. so do you see that with with swansea how's it like the place that you knew in the 1960s mm -hmm. and how is it different today yes it has changed a lot and um all that you say rings bells with Swansea. I feel some of the energy has gone out of it. Um, physically, the, the old centre is rather run down. There's been a lot of development of quite high quality new housing around the marina, the old dock area. And um, a little bit of the spirit has gone out of the place, I think. I mean, in terms of that rather old fashioned life of choirs and drama groups and discussion groups and political parties, you know, all, all the Mid mid twentieth century ferment, but what I think of as the Richard Hoggart world of um, you know bottom bottom up culture, and I I don't see so much of that. Yeah, it's interesting. I was a product of some of that bottom up culture back in the nineteen seventies. Mm. I was 
Of course, at the time, you don't realise it as a child on a council estate. Uh, I ended up playing the violin in a national youth orchestra only because there were free peripatetic lessons, free instruments. I mean, I, you know, that sort of engagement with culture that was made possible yes. in the 1970s was just, yes. you know, I look back now and think how, how stunning it was. I know, I know. The, the absence of that mm. from our fabric of mm. society mm. today. Um, so, Rowan, can you tell us a little bit about your parents? Um, mm. Whatever comes to mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, my father came from a mining family. Um, his father had been a miner in Dowlas, um, just over the mountain, basically. Um, and most of his family had been in industry in various ways. His, uh, let me see, one of his brothers was a miner. Another one worked in the tin plate works in um, Clidach in the Swansea Valley. My father really got out of it by... Um, being trained as an engineer in the RAF during the war. So that gave him a sort of exit pass to um, a life basically as a kind of civil service engineer, um, kind of passported into the lower middle class of the day. Um, my mother's family were shopkeepers and farmers, so a rather different kind of thread in the village. And they had they'd been in the village oh, since the 18th century. Basically, I, I can trace my mother's side back to rural Carmarthenshire in the 18th century, and mostly it's farming, I'm moving gradually from Carmarthenshire into um, Breckenshire. Um, and her generation, yes, yeah, so were mostly in, in trade or a little bit of farming. Mm. My, um, it's interesting, I'm, I'm working my way through the road to Wigan Pier. Mm. I started tracing my family tree and of course you know you hear that your grandparents and above were coal miners and have, mm. have absolutely no conception of what that was they never talked about it when i was a, a child or my great uh, uncles and realized the brutality of it um with my inheritance from uh, newcastle is is an extant alcoholism that i i think i can trace back to the brutality of the environment that they were they were in but your parents um have a um, there's the background, as I understand it, of a sort of non, non of the nonconformist Presbyterian. That a different. I'm just contrasting it with where I'm trying to picture of my grandparents and above, and what as, as a Catholic environment that they were mm -hmm. they were predominantly in. Well, what was that like for them to establish mm -hmm. a way of life for them and community and family? Mm -hmm. I think for everybody of, of their generation, and obviously older generations, the chapel one way or another, was an absolutely dominant presence. Now, of course, in a place like Astrid Gunlice, which was a substantial village, not quite a market town, but almost, there'd be several chapels, but social life really revolved around that to a degree which is quite hard to imagine now. And even up until my teens, I'd say, the, the, last, um, the last remnants of that were still visible in the area. So chapel was where you... You met your friends, it's where you had a certain amount of extra education. Um, as people have often said, it trained people in the arts of argument and debate through adult Sunday schools. So moving from that into the world of, let's say, the, the trade unions wasn't such a huge step. You, you used some of those skills. And then, of course, there was all the, uh, the world of music and choral singing, particularly in the chapels. So it, it was quite a comprehensive atmosphere. I wouldn't say that either of my parents came from a particularly pious background, but they they and their families would have identified definitely with with chapel. Everybody did, more or less. Um, the, the old joke, which you doctors have heard about the, the Welshman who's um, marooned on a desert island, and when he's rescued, they find he's built two chapels, and they ask him why two chapels, and he says, "That's the one I belong to, and that's the one I wouldn't be seen dead in." <laughs> so that was part of uh, <laughs> part of the church climate of <laughs> South right. Wales in those days. Fantastic. I um, I'm glad I'm not. I'm not. I wouldn't even try and tell any Welsh jokes. But, uh, <laughs> that's a good one. I know. One of my favourites. But um, yes, it, you didn't have to be particularly devout to feel that this was. This was the climate. It, it went with, um, yes, quite a strong feeling of your obligations to the community. In some ways, not very friendly to individual 
initiative or creativity. Um, very anti-Catholic still, that was still a powerful theme. Um, difficult to know exactly where the politics was. And traditionally people have talked about um, Welsh chapel life as fairly closely connected with either liberal or leftish politics. And certainly at the beginning of the 20th century, that was emphatically true with the Presbyterians leading the campaign for the disestablishing of the Anglican Church in Wales. I wouldn't say that was very much in evidence by, by the 50s, say. Um, and when we spent our few years in Cardiff and belonged to a Presbyterian church there, I'd have said on the whole the climate was um, a bit on the conservative side. Small C, but occasionally quite large C too. And my parents' politics were conservative. Mm. I think about my um, growing up in childhood. You know, so in, in England, you know, Anglican buildings, you have this thin rendering of them. And in the imagination, it's that strange place that people go to to do something strange. And it doesn't furnish the imagination anymore for local community in, in that secular environment. So that makes me wonder, with, with the importance of that and the picture that you paint, uh, and a question I'll come to later about how you, you talked about the, the excitement and the mental maps of Presbyterianism. But is there any of that left there in Wales? Because I, I go and see my friends there and, you know, and they'll often say that chapel closed down, this one's mm -hmm. empty. What, what is, is there any mm -hmm. residue of that there for community? It surfaces occasionally. Um, and I think it surfaces very indirectly. Um, I remember I was asked, oh, after about 20 years ago, to write something for the Western Mail in Wales when I was Archbishop of Wales um, for the millennium um, about Welsh identity and the Welsh future. And I, I wrote a little piece saying, well, you know, part of the, the contemporary Welsh DNA is still a very strongly cooperative approach to politics and public life, um, which has its links, yes, with, with the Christian ethos and particularly with the close-knit environment of the chapels. Even when it's become rather secularized, there is still that um, kind of list towards um, the public good. And the way I see the Welsh Assembly having worked, it's, it's interesting that they, they have quite often um, reflected some of that cooperativist legacy. For example, um, but it was the Welsh Assembly was the first legislative body in the UK to pass um, legislation requiring all future legislation to incorporate some, um, some consideration of the environmental and social impact of legislation, sort of future-proofing element in legislation. I think some of the, um, the policies around community health, about education have reflected something of that. So that's where I see it. But I think in terms of the, the actual explicit Christian presence in Wales, one, one of the most startling things in my lifetime is to see how from a position where, when I was between 15 and 20, said there was still a very visible element in Welsh public life, all of that's rather fallen off a cliff. Um, and yeah, I, I feel that's, that's a bit of a tragedy. I can see why, I can see what it's all about, and I think it has left a legacy, but it's it's a pretty secularised one. I mean, if I could press into that a little, the word that came to mind for me was like, you know, extinguished, um, mm. you know, this, this light and life. Do, do you have an, a, it's an, it's an enormous question, I know, but what 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 led to that cliff edge? What, what precipitated that? How could something so vibrant just yeah. I think that there are, maybe three or four factors going on here. One, you'd have to trace right back to the, um, the controversies over the disestablishing of the, the church in Wales. I think for about oh, 20, 30 years, a huge amount of the energy of Welsh Presbyterianism went into the campaign to, um, to remove the Church of England, as it was, from its privileged position. And I think when that finally happened, it was almost as if the Presbyterians looked around and said, well, now what do we do? <laughs> and there'd been so much focus on, on winning that battle that um, perhaps there wasn't very much energy for other things. But it took a while for that to work its way through, I think. And when I say that, I also think of some of the great 
intellectual and spiritual giants of mid-century in the Welsh nonconformist world um, who, who would be sound evidence against a simple version of what I've just said. It, you know, it, it didn't dry up overnight, but that was one factor. I think alongside that, you have the, the secularizing environment of the whole of British society in the 50s onwards. You have alternative vehicles for social life and socializing. Um, you have, yes, you have the club taking over from the chapel, you have the pub taking over from the chapel to some extent. Um, and that's not just peculiar to Wales. I think the third element is the complication introduced by the language. On the whole, Welsh nonconformity was deeply wedded to Welsh-speaking culture um, and played a fantastically important role in that. Many of the great poets of that the generation of, I suppose, the late 19th, early 20th century were actually nonconformist clergy. And the National Estelvert of Wales depends depended and still does depend heavily on a lot of nonconformist clergy and their families. Um, as the demography of Wales changed, um, as Wales became more urbanised, as communities opened up rather more um, with new communications, I think probably between about 19, say 1930 and 1970, there was a period when the future of the Welsh language looked rather uncertain. Communities were being broken up. A new generation like mine were much less likely to be brought up in Welsh. And if you have a Christian body very wedded to that particular kind of culture, um, you know, you're a bit vulnerable if that, um, that shifts. And I think that was going on. Now, of course, from the 60s onwards, the, the pro-Welsh language movement gathered momentum and political force, and things changed quite, quite dramatically in the 70s. Welsh became once again a you know, language for public discourse in a new way. But by that time, I think some of the ways in which the chapel had been allied to a, a rather old fashioned kind of Welsh, Welsh speaking culture, they had ceased to make sense for many people. Gosh, yes. Sorry, I could press into the importance of uh, language and Christian faith. Um, yes, yes. Some other antecedents. Um, can I ask, thank you, uh, can I ask you about uh, William Williams and uh, Crim Ronda? Mm. Um, I understand um, your uh, the importance. Well, it it was obviously important at your installation as as Archbishop, but I understand that there's a bit more about that. There's a there's a background to that hymn for you. Am I am I right? Is there a family history to do with that hymn? Well, I don't think William Williams was uh, a member of the family. Will Williams, as you know, are. Uh, to a penny in Wales, um, <laughs> like Clarks. My grandfather used to say, uh, used to remind me that you know, I was very devastated to find out how many Clarks there were in the world when I was younger. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are more Welsh jokes on surnames, but I'll spare you those. Um, yeah, I, th I think one of the things which was still alive in our teenage years was that hymns like that were things that we sang together on social occasions and parties and so on, or in, um, in coaches on school trips, <laughs> quite self-consciously, not because we were devout, but because that was part of, part of the heritage, part of what we just, just saw all sort of knew. Um, it took me a while, frankly, to realize that William Williams, Williams Mount Kellen, as he's called in Wales, is a really substantial religious poet. And of course he, he wrote I think over a thousand hymns, almost as many as Charles Wesley. And there's a particular kind of um, sensibility, a sort of metaphorical world that he uses, which, which very often focuses on two things. One is the sense of journey, which is there in Guide Me, O Thy Great Redeemer, Pilgrim Through This Barren Land. Lord, lead us through the desert, is how it begins. And there are several of his hymns where the imagery of a long journey, a long nighttime journey over a, a mist-shrouded hill, that sort of image comes. That's, that's life. That's, that's what it's like. Um, 
and you expect all the time some glimpse. You expect the clouds to break, and from time to time there's this extraordinary illumination of the landscape, and you know you can keep walking. That's a very typical Pantakelian sort of thing. The other imagery that is very prominent in him is, I suppose, just that of longing, um, deep, deep longing for a homecoming to God. And um, two of his hymns, which are not readily available in translation, um, are for me among the most extraordinary things he ever wrote. One is, Yesi, Yesi, Rutim Vigon, literally, Jesus, you are, you are enough, you're all sufficient. And that has the unforgettable lines in it. There are more treasures in your name than all the wealth of India. Wow. <laughs> and um, that, that hymn comes back again and again to, oh, if, you know, if only I could be there to see this. And I know I can't now, but I know it's there. And another of the hymns, um, The Golden Harp, Adelian Ayer, The Sound of the Golden Harp. Um, we start singing now because we can hear the echoes, as it were, from the, the heavenly future of the golden harp. Uh, but we keep walking, keep going. Oh, how rich and wonderful. Yeah. There's all the world of difference between knowing a hymn that was played at obviously one of the most important events in your life, but knowing what that meant a little bit here for for you in terms of your own uh, worship experience and faith. Thank you for for sharing that. Um, can I ask you about when you when you obviously you were very young, um, you had meningitis, and mm -hmm. I think you were. I mean, there was an expectation that you might die from it, and I know. I mean, the the question I'm wanting to reach in with with you and these are things I, I i've read that you talk about um in other places that the importance of parents in in the faith and development of children obviously is unquestionable but but for you what was that like if you can speak to it for your parents um having to go through that what what how did that affect them yes. and their disposition with you for the rest of your life yes i think as i grew older and certainly as I grew to adulthood, I, I realized more and more just what a price they'd paid. I think from, I suppose, from when I was about two to when I was about six or seven, it was all still a bit fragile. And I think they must have felt that they had to, to watch and be there and spot every little wobble 24 hours a day. And I, I was a, a sickly child, even after that, I had pneumonia a couple of times. I um, had for a long time a quite severe asthmatic condition and, and so on and so on. Um, so I think what a, what a burden of anxiety, what a burden of attention must have been laid on them. And I was an only child and I suspect that my health and my fragility was a factor in that, frankly. They probably didn't think they could manage anything or anyone else and and I think that meant that um, I had what only children normally experience which is a, an enormous weight of emotional investment and projection with a little bit of extra refinement from that um, that experience of near death so yeah I, th I think looking back there was a, a heavy emotional load for them and in a sense, for me, as I grew up to feel, feeling that reflected. And, and, and if I may, were you aware of any religious textures to to that period of time? Mm. Take with you that your parent, when you get your parents' engagement in that. To be honest, I never quite knew where they would want to put themselves religiously. We went to chapel um, from, well, I suppose, five years old. I was regular in Sunday school in the, the old style every Sunday afternoon. And we had in the local chapel in Cardiff at that point, an enormous Sunday school, about 500 children, um, which was run like a, a small university. <laughs> Serious programs of biblical study, examinations, um, public, um, public celebrations and events where you'd get up and recite your scripture verses or you'd 
at your prizes for scripture knowledge. Oh, it was <laughs> quite intense. And, and that, that was very much part of our lives. Several years, they were regulars in chapel. I, I was regular in the Sunday school. And um, looking back, I think that Sunday school experience was a, a very big part of my own formation. Mm. I bet. So you see, my, my wife um, had a very different upbringing to mine. Strict brethren progressed oh, from strict yeah. brethren to evangelical brethren. She talks about her childhood memories of hats and lines in the church and letters of recommendation and, I, I mean, and Sunday services and then Sunday schools. And I counted up the number of hours that she would have spent before we met at, um, when we met at London School of Theology. I mean, it's tens of thousands of hours of Christian formation and discipleship built into her. And actually, she was someone who actually loved that whole time, loved the quizzes and the questioning. And, mm. the and I envy that deep formational heritage that she has. Um, I know some people have, have rejected that, but I, mm. I, I can hear the reservoir mm. that, that was, was for you. And, and that's I, what I really recognise that. Um, I, don't, I don't know how many hours, but um, it was a, a pretty intensive kind of formation. And I've always been grateful for that absolute saturation week after week in, in the Bible. I remember too um, the way in which we were encouraged rather unusually at the time to look at modern biblical translations. We all had um, little Bible reading booklets to work out, sort of quarterly booklets, and the texts given were given not in the King James Version but in the old Moffat translation into modern-ish English a um, couple of other possible translations. In other words, you were expected to understand what you read and expected to be a little, little bit adventurous about, about that. Oh, fantastic. It's, um, I mean, I'll jump to a question I was going to ask you later. I think it was with, with Melvin Bragg. You talked about the, the mental lands, your mental landscape being shaped by your, the, that Presbyterian experience. You used the word excitement mm. uh, and then energy uh, there. Um, how much of that, is still with you today? I know that's a difficult que question uh, with all the other things that have been mapped into your life over the years, but... Um... I, I'm deeply thankful for that. I, I feel that I, although in a sense the, the great influence of Presbyterianism and Welsh life had peaked and begun to decline by the 1950s, I still felt I was getting some of the very best of that intellectually alert, um, and also quite passionate ethos of Welsh Presbyterianism. Um, it, we were an English-speaking chapel, but part of a largely Welsh-speaking denomination. And our minister belonged to a very, very distinguished dynasty of um, Welsh theologians and poets. And his preaching was extraordinarily focused and vigorous and and you felt it was preaching that took the congregation seriously. Mm, fantastic. And now it's a bit of a cliche that the Welsh have historically been highly respectful of education. Mm. Um, and was that case in your household growing up? Was there a, that milieu of, 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 of and, and, and how did that, um, I mean, was that emerging at the time you were there or was it there previously? And again, I'm, mind, I'm making my own personal connections. My parents growing up on a council estate, working class background, had this aspiration of education that had not been on my mm. side of the family. And they, had, they were a generation who had been told not to engage in education. And it had, a, had quite a, a, a big impact upon them for the rest of their lives. But, but so what, what, was, what was this like for you? Education was front and centre as, as an aspiration. Neither of my parents had been to college. Um, my father had picked up, of course, quite a lot in terms of his education as an engineer. But um, I think it was taken for granted that the next generation should aspire in that direction. My mother's father had been, um, among other things, a, a bookbinder very enthusiastic amateur bookbinder. <clears throat> and that had gone together with the fact that he enjoyed the books that he bound. And so he had a very eclectic collection of stuff he'd, he'd read avidly. And I think when I 
started showing signs of being a sort of bookish child, I was very much encouraged in that. And as I said earlier, going to the kind of um, secondary school I did in Swansea, um, there was an assumption that, yes, education was vastly important, that, that children deserved the best, that you stretched people as, as much as they could be. And of course, it was, it was still at that time a climate in which there was the great watershed of the 11 plus and people were consigned to outer darkness at a very early stage. Mm -hmm. and that was not good. Um, no two ways about that. But for those of us who did make it over that particular style, um, it, it was as if the world opened up very, very richly and you would be encouraged again and again to explore. Mm. Gosh, amazing. Thank you. Um, so, Rowan, your family moved back to Swansea and to the Mumbles, which is a was then a more prosperous area and, and still is today. And you, you mentioned your, your father's, yeah, I think you used the word escape, that with his training as an engineer mm -hmm. from the war was able to um, escape. Was, was the move primarily to, to the Mumbles because of this uh, prospering that he was taking place in as an engineer? Well, he'd been offered a new job in Swansea. Um, I remember the day when we all went to look at houses in Swansea and just fell in love with this particular one, which was about 100 yards from the seafront, Swansea Bay. And um, yes, I think it was a step up in some ways, a um, little step up. And uh, again, we found ourselves in what was really a, a village atmosphere there. Um, it was, of course, it was popular with visitors and tourists, but not at all to the extent it is now. It still had lots of um, village family businesses and a very strong sense of village community, which was in a strange way, not completely unlike Astrid Gunlice and rather unlike suburban Cardiff. Oh, fantastic. Well, thank you for letting me um, take a dive there into your the formative uh, period of your childhood. But I want to pivot now towards how a young man in a nonconformist Presbyterian um, <laughs> Welsh revivalist background became an Anglican. Mm. I understand, and just in passing as an anecdote, I, I, I understand that you took yourself on your own mm. to the local Anglican church. Mm but then asked your parents to take you back. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering if, if I can take you back to that moment. What, as, as, a, as a very young man, was that a radical thing for you to do and then you needed your parents' permission afterwards? Or what, what was that whole mm -hmm. process that obviously changed the whole course of your life? Well, clearly, yes. That um, one decision, that one visit. Looking back, I'm very puzzled in a way as to what was really going on. Um, We'd, we'd been worshipping, there wasn't a, a Presbyterian church locally, we'd been worshipping with the Wesleyan Methodists for a bit. Um, and I'm not sure that it quite grabbed us in the way that Chapel back in Cardiff had. And just a couple of hundred yards down the road from the Methodist chapel was this large old parish church. And I just thought, well, I'd like, I'd like to see what happens there. And so I remember it was, it was Passion Sunday, it was two weeks before Easter in, I think, 1962 or three. And um, I just went at nine o'clock in the morning on my own to see what, what they did. Did you have to notify your parents? Did you, I imagine you sneaking out the house? I, I sneaked out and left them a little note, actually. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, how many children leave their parents a note to say they're sneaking off to church? That's <laughs> a very weird child. <laughs> but, uh, I, I really was blown away by what I encountered. I think, although it, it wasn't a particularly, not an exceptionally high church environment, it was a bit more ritualistic. Um, Vestments, a procession, and so on. But there's something about the, the, yes, the drama, the richness of the environment, absolutely spoke to me. And I thought, oh yes, you know, I want to, I want to know more about this. So I you know, went back and explained to my parents um, why I'd been enthused by it, and and said, well, would you know, why don't we go together? <laughs> 
So we did. And um, in fact, we were all eventually confirmed together on the same night. Oh, gosh. Amazing. In, in the Anglican Church. And again, I, I've said it many times, but um, worth saying again, I was so fortunate in having there, as in Cardiff, um, an example of clerical leadership and pastoring, which was, you know, out of the ordinary. The local parish priest who spent, I think, nearly 30 years in that parish was a man of such um, sensitivity, intelligence, prayerfulness, um, and warmth. But you know, ever since then, he has been one of my ideals of Christian priesthood, just a person of rock-like integrity and deep spirituality. Wonderful. I'll come back to, I want to ask you a question about um, that, that vicar in a moment, but um, again, if I may, so this, this experience, it, it sounds less like you, Im it was disjunctive in some way. You emerged from one Christian experience into something you'd never experienced before. It, it sounds like there was a sort of furnishing and preparation was, was, you know, the richness that you had, helped you just suddenly there's another richness that I'm, I'm hearing was it, was it that's, a good, that's a good way of putting it um and it takes me back to a conversation i had with a, another priest in swansea i very much respected as a teenager um who talked about the different kinds of richness in christian experience and how important it was not to not to think that everything had to be invested in one bit of the map um it was a point at which I was thinking quite a bit about whether I ought to be a Roman Catholic. Um, and he said, in effect, yeah, okay, but, you know, if you become a Roman Catholic, you might find yourself saying no to things that you ought to, hang, to be hanging on to. Right. And I kind of filed that away for future reference. <laughs> it's, as, as the years have gone on, it seemed to be more and more true. Yes. I, so I hear there, so there was this obviously internal move within you in terms of your thinking for your own faith of needing something more. I mean, you're obviously making an Anglo-Catholic turn. Mm. I have many of my friends I went to London School of Theology with, as I say, who've made that similar turn, contemplated it myself because of the, for me, the, the looking for an environment of faith with a rich thought life integrated into faith, mm. uh, as much as I have treasured my low church, um, charismatic mm. evangelicalism it, it's been a it's been a very fecund place for me and i understand why many of my friends have, have, have made that journey so that was already going on inside you before oh. you took that trip to this local church i think so and um, i think one, one of the things that um grabbed me about broadly speaking the anglo-catholic environment and heritage was something which We'll come back to this later, I'm sure. Something which was very much put before us as part of the story, the the 19th century story of the Anglo-Catholic slum priests, you know, the, the people who'd gone to the poorest areas in the cities of Britain to bring the richness of, of the gospel and also advocacy for their their interests. So I, I guess um, from when I was about 14, that that story was around. Um, one of our former curates in, in the parish had gone out to South Africa to work, and he would occasionally come back to visit, eventually came back to be university chaplain in Swansea. And of course, he would be talking about the apartheid struggle. And uh, Trevor Huddleston's Not For Your Comfort came out in the early 60s. And that all fed into this sense of this this particular kind of religious identity, not just being about what you did in church, but about the, sh the shape of a community, the nature of God's justice. And um, I, th I think as, as my teens went on, that really began to dig itself in for me. So, so at this young age, this Anglican social theology, social life, community life, you, you, you could see and were attracted by um, at so many levels. Is mm. that, I mean, the question I had written down for today was there, there are so many types of Anglicanism, but you're already delineating for me the, what that sort of Anglicanism was that you, you came into. 
Yeah, that's that's very largely what I did come into. That's what um, animated and inspired. And because I was already thinking I wanted to be a candidate for ordination, I thought, well, that's the kind of priest I'd really like to be. And um, oh, it's embarrassing, really, but I, <laughs> I remember writing an essay in school um, on the subject, myself in 10 years' time. You know, the sort of essay that occasionally... Oh, gosh, yeah. <laughs> and I, was, I guess I must have been about 15. Do you still have a copy? <laughs> um, I, I hope not. <laughs> I don't want this to be in the public sphere. But I do remember writing a, a very romantic picture of um, what, what life might be like for me being a curate in uh, a parish in Cardiff Docks. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> so if I can ask you about the vicar, because the impact, my... Um, it, I became came a Christian when I was 17, spent three years with a wonderful youth pastor who, you know, when you, like you say, you meet someone who has a kind of faith you aspire to, mm -hmm. uh, an integration into their life. It, it's amazing that 30 years on, my wife will still say to me, oh my goodness, you sounded just like your old youth pastor, Andy Hickford. Mm -hmm. These formative impressions that that, that godly people make that you aspire to could i could i ask you the name of the vicar and you you you, you said this has been a, a lifelong impression on you eddie hughes eddie hughes, eddie hughes. Wonderful. Um, yes and as i say it was it was that mixture of the imaginative the the pastoral the prayerful and the intelligent he he was somebody who really, to put it in a nutshell, gave the impression that faith faith could be an unafraid sort of thing. I never remember him being sort of nervous or um, anxious about, about faith. He would just, as it were, open the doors and say, here we are, come in, be at home, help yourself, with the riches of the tradition. Um, he, he was somebody who read poetry and fiction very avidly. Um, he was somebody who was a great lender of books. Um, and he and a couple of other clergy in the parish, younger clergy who came as curates in succession, had something of the same spirit. And you know, I, I look around at my, my bookshelves even now and say, well, it was it was Eddie who let me that, it was Eric who let me that, it was Hugh who let me that. <laughs> Clergy who were who were concerned that you kept your eyes and your ears and your heart open, and as I've sometimes put it in the past, who gave the sense that this faith was big enough to cope with anything that human culture could throw at it. So don't panic. You know, this is this is a big world, um, and God's a grown up. <laughs> He's not going to run off and. Uh, and panic, so you don't have to panic. So that sense that the the intellectual richness I was discovering in school and in other ways, the imaginative force of the poetry and drama I was getting interested in, all that seemed just to fold in absolutely naturally. It all came back to to the faith that was expressed day by day, week by week at the Eucharist. Oh, wonderful. Well, that leads us on to the next uh, stage of life to ask you about um, how you decided to study theology at university um, and Cambridge. Was there just an inevitability at this point um, or a singular moment of decision along the way? Mm, I don't think there was much of a Damascus Road moment of thinking about it. I, I suppose I went for Cambridge partly because um, I had an uncle who lived there for a bit. I'd been to visit the place, liked it, thought, well, you know, have a go. But theology, yes. Um, from quite an early point, I'd, I'd had that fascination with the scriptural texts, with the history of the church, and so on. I wanted to be a candidate for ordination. So, yes, reading theology seemed the thing to do. But um, I didn't, in fact, do religious studies for A-level at school. Um, because actually in those days religious studies at school could be extremely dull and the wrong kind of biblical study you know where you just 
to the missionary journeys of St. Paul over and over again. Um, so I did English and history and Latin at A level, and it was English that really grabbed me, and I sat my scholarship examination for Cambridge in English, in fact, not, uh-huh. not religious studies. And I did, from time to time, have a bit of a wobble and think, well, maybe I should be studying English. But um, stuck to it. I think when I first went up to Cambridge and was struggling with learning Greek and Hebrew from scratch, I thought, you know, maybe English would be a lot easier. <laughs> but um, I stuck with it and I haven't regretted that. Fantastic. I think there's a, there's a little story of how you ended up at Christ College instead of St. John's. Oh, yes. and, and a resolution to that story with... Uh, Andrew McIntosh McIntosh, uh, later in life. Could you tell us about that? Well, I don't know what went on. I was interviewed at St. John's um, by Andrew McIntosh, God bless him, who's still a great friend. Um, In those days, the Cambridge colleges um, took applications in clusters. Six or or so colleges would group together. So obviously I wasn't up to scratch for St. John's who passed me down the line to Christ's College. I don't know how many passes there were in that. That's where I ended up. Um, You've never inquired. <laughs> I've never inquired, no. no. But uh, it was diverting when I came back to Cambridge first to teach, to meet Andrew McIntosh again and uh, remind him that he'd said no to me <laughs> 10 years before. Funnily enough, we now, both of us, um, regularly help at the same local parish in, in Cambridge. So, now I understand in that story that he did he s- make a, a a fun and relational nod to his mis- what he would deem his mistake in having passed you on thirty years later. Was, was there? I, I don't know. <laughs> Doubtless there are stories going oh, around about it. <laughs> he wrote something to you um, uh, uh, in, in in jest and in the. Oh well, of course we we have teased each other. I'm, I'm, uh, this is my background reading reading for you about that story. I find it fascinating. Yeah, we've we've teased each other about it. Yes. Oh, fantastic. So, um, you're at Cambridge, and we've already talked about the impact of people. Mm. Um, so, I which was so there specific tutors who then took on that kind of role in mm. life, impact and formation mm. um, that you could comment on? Yes, well, I, I was very, very fortunate in all the supervisors and tutors I had. Um, it would be quite difficult to pick one out over the others, but I suppose the two big names that were rather more senior level, people I didn't obviously see much of face-to-face because they were senior, but who helped to shape the, the feel of... The department. One was Charlie Mole, who was the professor of New Testament, um, CFD Mole, um, who was a really wonderfully humble, unassertive, um, and gentle man who al- always began his lectures with, with prayer and could fill the largest lecture room in the Divinity School on a Saturday morning for his lectures on the New Testament, because to see him engaging patiently and thoroughly with with the text of the New Testament, he would would just lecture his way through pretty well the whole of the New Testament canon. And I think people went just to see him in action, to see somebody reading the Bible with all the skill and devotion you could. But he also... Um, kept open house one night a week for students who wanted to come and, and discuss things. And um, if you went to those, there'd be a little bit of socialising, and then somebody would be invited to give a brief introduction to a, a topic in New Testament theology, and we'd talk about that. And I used to go to those, especially in my third year, and I saw a bit of him at closer quarters and became a great devotee of his. In fact, it was he who, who took our wedding service eventually because he taught my wife as well and he'd been a friend of my wife's father. So he was, he was a big influence on me as on many. And the other very different personality was um, Donald McKinnon, who was then the professor of philosophy of religion. Um, utterly, utterly different, a very eccentric, tormented personality with um, a huge, huge range of 
intellectual interests, very much, in fact, part of the same kind of left-wing Anglo-Catholic environment that I was used to with lots of contacts with um, people who've been important in that world in earlier generations. Um, you know, he'd known and worked with people like, um, I think, Maurice Reckitt and Vigo de Mant and so forth. His earliest um, publications had been very much out of that stable. And I went to his lectures regularly, and the lectures were completely useless if you wanted to pass exams, because Donald would go off on some unbelievably abstruse sidelines, obsessively, and yet, if you stuck it out, you knew that you'd, you'd just see more. And he was one of those people who perhaps taught me that um, the really significant thing in education is those moments when you get to see more, not when you just solve problems or get the answers to the exam questions, but your world keeps growing. And Donald would talk about, um, about Lenin, and contemporary um, student radicalism on the continent. And he'd talk about Aeschylus and Greek tragedy. He'd talk about Shakespeare. He'd talk about um, out of the way philosophers you've never heard of. He'd talk about growing up in the Western Isles of Scotland and, and so on and so on. And you just had a, a very three-dimensional time with him. Um, so he perhaps, did at that stage a bit of what Eddie did for me as a teenager, giving me the sense that there might not be answers to all your problems, but the Christian and you know, broadly Christian Catholic framework was big enough to take things, to, to hold and carry really intractable problems without breaking down, and to give you a real way of thinking and feeling into the heart of human experience. That, above all, uh, my debt to Donald was and is just enormous. Fantastic. Wonderful. Thank you. So, um, thinking of you with this rich theological, relational faith experience, what what is it like being in Cambridge at that time? As I understand it, the, again, I've used that word before, but there was a ferment socially taking place, wasn't it? What, what was the integration or interplay between that experience for you? Yes. Well, I, I feel I was very fortunate to have my student experience in, in the 60s, for all that people could be a bit um, sneery about the 60s. It was, you know, it's quite a, quite a period to be growing up in. Um, and I was very much aware of, of that, of the international perspectives that were opening up. Um, once again, the issues around apartheid, issues around international peace and justice, and some issues too on the doorstep. Um, I've sometimes told the story of how, on I think my second or third night in Cambridge, I, I met a homeless person in the street and just got talking and walked around the streets with him for an hour or two, just, just trying to understand a bit about about his experience, and that meant that for the next three years I, I was quite often in contact with or working with homeless people in Cambridge, which again gave me a little bit of a, a sidelight on uh, the university. And uh, it was a reminder that however, however fascinating and lively and rich the university experience was, there was another world alongside which you really would do well not to forget if you were pretending to be a Christian of any kind. So that, that became important. I belonged to the, the student Christian movement, which was then rather at the height of its, its radicalism. And one of the things we did there was um, to run a, a weekly reading group every term. So about half a dozen of us would, um, would take a book which we'd read and discuss every Friday afternoon for an hour or two. And uh, that's how I got to read Richard Hoggart's Uses of Literacy, a very important book for me. How I got to read um, some books about um, educational change and reform. Um, I wish I could remember the detail now, but there was one very impressive book about a, a visionary headmaster who turned around a comprehensive school in a, 
struggling urban area. I think we even read um, Townsend's Family and Kinship in East London. We were very earnest. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. So um, I want to move on to your postgraduate um, theological things, and then we can start to get on the, the, the run down to the end of the interview with more, more theological uh, uh, topics. But um, at this point, so as you move on to do a PhD at Oxford, if I can ask you what theology meant to you, I, I mean, you already prefaced the bit of this interview with the idea that you know there was there was nothing that god couldn't handle <laughs> as we in inquired of him and i can see the energy and the passion and the relationships and the stimulation and the formation and i guess i'm asking because many people are deeply suspicious of theology that it leads to something less than the formation of a a suitable Christian imagination and participation in society mm -hmm. but it seems that you discovered the opposite well Absolutely, yes. Yes, I think throughout my time studying it as an undergraduate, I, I was conscious of great excitement and stimulus with it. But there was one particular moment early in my third year. I was thinking through some themes for an essay on the early church, some aspect of early Christian doctrine. And there was a moment I can still recall walking down the street in Cambridge when it was as if all kinds of themes and topics I've been looking at in bits and pieces came together. And I, I thought, yes, this really is all about the same thing. It is all about the one act of God. And what I'm doing is simply trying to pray and think and imagine my way into the workings of that one act of God, which I will never get on top of, but which is reflected like light bouncing off the walls of a dark cave. You, from everywhere you look, the light comes back at you. And that sense that it was all about the same basic topic that struck me with such force at that point. Just around the same time, it must have been, I was doing some work for my, for my Hebrew. And one of our set texts was the uh, Third Servant Song. Um, in Isaiah, and I was in my room and working through the Hebrew text and <clears throat> making notes of the grammar of <laughs> uh, each sentence, each verse. And I'd been rumbling away through chapter 52 of Isaiah and realized all of a sudden I was getting into the servant song. And I, I saw it rising through the words, through the unfamiliar Hebrew. And what struck me was, it's as if I really am seeing and hearing this for the first time. This is it. This really is, well, I suppose this is the word somehow. This is the reality coming through. So by the time I was in my third year as an undergraduate, the, these moments of sensing the integration of it all, the, the reality shining through, that, that had become very, very strong. And I knew I wanted to go on making room for that and trying to reflect it to others and even you know presumptuously trying to make it real for others so i think i i think i probably knew at that point that in some way or another i, I was going to be a theological teacher whatever else wonderful so you progressed um to for your phd at oxford and if i can pick up there you, it appears that you developed an interest in Eastern, or Eastern Orthodox mm. theology and mm. Russian culture. Is that where that started? How did that? No, that went back quite a long way before, actually. I, I kind of caught the bug when I was a teenager, being fascinated by Russian music and art, and um, beginning to cast an eye on Russian novels a little bit. As an undergraduate, I'd kept up that interest. And I'd also, as an undergraduate, met this very remarkable Russian emigre called Nikos Zernov, um, who was, uh, I suppose you'd call him a church historian, basically, but he was also somebody who simply made it his job to, to open up the Russian Christian world to people. And he wrote this long and very detailed, very exciting book on the Russian religious renaissance of the 20th century, looking at that remarkable period before the First World War when 
lots of intellectuals and artists in Russia began, as it were, to drift back into the Orthodox Church and renew their thinking, their social thinking, their philosophy, with in, in a kind of dialogue with Orthodox theology. And when I heard Nicholas speaking, I knew, well, that's what I really want to do my research on. Ah, wonderful. Thank you. Could you say a little bit about uh, Losky, the theologian, um, and the meaning of the Russian word Sobonost? Sobonost, yes, yes. Uh, I, I, my cursory understanding of it is it's, uh, it's a Slavic correspondence to, uh, to the word Catholic in the Nicene right. Greek but but more redolent of togetherness and sim mm -hmm. symphony that's as i say yeah. Yeah. yes well on subornost it's a word that really comes into its own in the middle of the 19th century mostly in the work of um, a lay theologian called Khomyakov. and what he argues is something like this it's the word used in in the creed one holy catholic apostolic church in Russian one holy subordinate. And not and subordinate and subordinost are not quite the same as Catholici in Greek, because the the roots of the adjective subordinate are about gathering about um, community, not just wholeness, but particularly a sort of convening a gathering together. And subordinost is, yes, in a way it's togetherness. Um, sometimes it's translated rather horribly as conciliarity, which doesn't get very much further. But it is that, that feeling of, as Homyakov says in his studies of the word, the, the wholeness of the Christian community, the wholeness of the Christian truth is a wholeness which is actively interactive and communal. You don't ever have in the church um, a division between teaching and learning church. You don't have a top-down authority. You have um, a discovery of the truth inseparable from the quality of your relation. And if you get to your relation right, if you are in subordinate relations with one another, if you have that conciliar um, encounter-based mutual body of Christ type relationship, really, then you actually have access to truth at a level that you don't just with your mind. Similarly, if you understand that Christian truth is about the, um, the unity and difference of the Trinity, the unity in difference of the divinity and humanity in Jesus, and the unity and multiplicity of the church, then your experience opens out onto that. And for the Russian tradition, that, of course, becomes an important part of a sort of um, theological critique of both individualism and collectivism. So this is where Losky comes in. Losky sees the essence of authentic Christianity, and as he would see it, Orthodox Christianity, with a capital O and a small o, sees the essence of that as some... Um, standing in between two distortions. You can think of the church as a collectivity where individuality has to be subordinated to um, a common agenda. Or you can think of it as a gathering of individuals all pursuing their agenda more or less contained within um, some sort of loose association. Well, neither, says Losky, because the church is communion, the church is mutuality. And if, if the church says to the individual, you have to let go of your fiction of yourself as a self-sustained individual to enter into a relation, that's not, that's not a way of saying you've got to subordinate your particularity to a general, a general good. It's a way of saying the general good only happens when every person is involved in it. Every person only becomes themselves when they're involved in the general good. Um, again, it's, it's basically a kind of gloss on the idea of the body of Christ, to my mind. But you can see how this has implications for how you think about the, the way the church runs and the way society works as well. So to me, that, that was another of those integrative moments where you could see lots of things coming together. And Losky in his theology makes great play of the idea of the person 
and the difference between the idea of the person and the individual. A person is more than an individual because a person is someone finding their reality in relation, in community, giving and receiving, not ever being an atom isolated and cut off, but always forming and being formed in, in encounter. You can see in that elements of, um, I suppose, Martin Buber's I and Thou, just a little bit. You can see philosophical themes that come even from some aspects of um, existentialism. But Lossky drives it back again and again to the language of the early church about the nature of God as Trinity. And I, I found and still find Lossky's way of kind of drawing the map just colossally generative for me. And even now, go back to some of his essays and, um, and his books to, to clarify yet again this notion of what it is we're saying about the person. The person which is utterly unique and unrepeatable, and yet at the same time not just a, an isolated one-off. And the challenge of you know, sane human life, let alone a sane Christian life, is to hold on to those two things, the utter, utter mystery and uniqueness of every single human subject, and the fact that that utter uniqueness is constituted by the network, the interacting pattern of relationship, holding those together. Mm. I can lean into this a little, the, um, the importance of theological themes, motifs, concepts that you once you discover them I, I found and I'm hearing it with with you Ro and they they, they just it's almost like that there's a there's a it's an eschatological you're stepping into s something of the eschaton that opens up for you that that transports you and is going to change you in everything that you do so for me I was at a early on in some meetings listening in on some Anglo-Catholics and uh, Professor Andrew Walker was there and mm. I was I was listening to this this richness. Uh, I guess the early my early discovery of of Anglo Catholic understandings of the Eucharist and memberment into the body of Christ, and I could I could literally feel something palpable from my anomic secular humanist environment, and this mm. understanding theologically, and this doorway into what the body of Christ was a memberment. And Professor Walker, he could, I, he could, I think he could tell the moment that I was having. He leant over and he said, "These are not their treasures; these are yours too." Um, and I'm sorry, I'm not ma I'm mapping some of my personal experience, but the if I can lean into with you, so this moment happens to you, but you're still unpacking this even today. Oh, yes, yes. moment for you yeah absolutely yes yes in recent years um, well a couple of books that I've done one is a little book called being human which picks up some of these themes especially there's a discussion there about the person and the individual um, my longer book on Christ the heart of creation there's a great deal of Losky in there under the surface and more recently actually looking at um, Looking at some other Orthodox writers, I'm trying at the moment to put a book together of studies of a number of themes in Orthodox theology and connecting them with themes in um, contemporary theology more, more broadly. And Losky keeps coming back, keeps knocking on the door. Um, and I pick up the, the texts. He didn't write a great deal, didn't publish a huge amount, but I pick up the, the essays from the 50s and 60s and or the 50s, I should say, and, and look at them thinking, well, you know, that's, that's where I got this question from. You know how it is sometimes when you, you look at a book or something you haven't read for many years, and you say, oh, so that's where I got that idea from. I've forgotten, but that's why I think that. <laughs> Lossky still does that for me again and again. <laughs> thank you thank you for yeah it's, it's just wonderful to dig into who you know behind theologies the 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 people uh, who generate those and mm. the impact they have on us well if you've still got the stamina uh, rowan uh, to for me to ask you some more questions i want to lean into i think that leads us nicely into uh, looking specifically at anglican social 
mm. theology um, and correlating that with some of the challenges that we're facing at the, at the moment um, in culture. Um, and and uh, and I think I may have mentioned either before we started or at the the, the start here, um, the the impossibility. You're uh, getting myself oriented to today to your corpus of work was just impossible. Um, I think it was uh, Charles Matthews, the theologian. I remember I think reading him once saying Augustine should be grateful he never had to read. Augustine um, and I wonder if <laughs> Rowan Williams is glad that he doesn't have to read all of yeah. <laughs> but it's um, enormous corpus so um, we're, we're landing on we're picking and I've mentioned Martin Dean Martin Percy at Christchurch um, in Oxford I, I, I love the way um, he, he talks about an illustrative fragment and how one theological illustration from something can actually be mapped against and, and, and be illustrative of a much wider thing. So the topic of uh, uh, Anglican social theology um, uh, and faith in, in, in public life. So I want to, to, to for mm. my illustrative um, moment, to talk about Conrad Knoll. Mm. And you uh, did a recent speech on the 150th anniversary mm. of the, um, if I, I'm probably not wrong to call him a radical priest um, and in the 1970s um, could you tell us a little bit about if you can a potted picture of Conrad Knoll and, and then he's in the influences that you obviously I've read the speech but um, his influences on you politically and theologically. Knoll came from a very privileged background indeed um, from the heart of the English establishment of the upper classes and like many people in the late Victorian era, his education, his general sensibility, opened him up to the fact that this was a, a divided and diseased society. He'd become very committed to Catholic Anglicanism as a young man, and um, so decided he would offer himself ordination, and had great difficulty actually being accepted for ordination. Um, because people didn't like the fact that he was so um, articulate a socialist and so articulate an Anglo-Catholic. Um, and he wasn't one to give too much respect to bishops, a good old Anglo-Catholic tradition. <laughs> um, so, yes, he struggled to find work, really. He struggled to find a curacy. He worked for a bit with Percy Dearmer, the hymn writer, and again, Notable Christian Socialist in um, North London. And then his long term, most celebrated ministry was in Thaxted, in Essex, where he transformed the parish church into a, a real model of liturgical beauty, but also encouraged um, social community activity, notably, of course, Morris dancing and <laughs> that sort of thing. Um, made sure that his congregation heard a great deal about international affairs. Um, he was a strong supporter of Irish independence. He was, like many people, unfortunately, a quite uncritical supporter of Soviet Russia in its early days. Um, he was close to people like Chesterton. Um, and essentially, his his social vision rested on two things. One was this overwhelming sense, which he keeps coming back to, of the incarnation. God has embraced the flesh and blood of humanity. Therefore, God's concerns are the concerns of flesh and blood community. In a sense, end of. You know, that's all you need to know. Um, and the way in which God does embrace flesh and blood humanity in Jesus is, of course, in a figure who is consistently critical of unchallenged power, imperial power, a figure who is consistently aligned with those who are excluded from society, and so forth. So for him, that was a very clear message. And I think like others, he could sometimes talk rather loosely about um, the idea that the, the Trinity was a model of a perfect society. But, mm, I've got my theological qualms about that, but you see, you see what he means. The God we worship is not a celestial individual, but a celestial and terrestrial relationship, pattern relation. Mm. 
Absolutely right. So that's one of the themes, the incarnational Trinitarian. And the other connected with it is the sense that the Christian life, sorry, Christian discipleship lays on you the duty of transforming the whole cultural, social life around you. Hence the interest in um, the common, the ordinary common life of the village, hence the commitment to the Morris dancing and all the rest of it, but also a sense that the ordinary stuff of the world is to be taken seriously in the light of God. Um, and I've sometimes said that my, my own commitments around environmental issues go back to my first discovery of people like Conrad Noel as a teenager, and also my first encounters with Eastern Orthodox theology, where again, this is a, a major theme. If, um, if God has become in Christ a material reality, then material realities really matter. And the sacraments of the church are not least signs that God speaks through the material stuff of things and the, the work and the imagination, the solidarity and the struggle of actual human beings. So th those are two strands in Conrad Noel, which, um, as I say, struck me very forcibly when I first read about him. I was about 17, I guess, and that's when I was reading a lot of Chesterton as well. And um, I think those were things which were very much in our minds when Ken Leach and I and some others started the Jubilee Group in the 1970s. Something of that legacy of, if you like, a Christian socialism that was more than just political, but also had a real alertness to, both to liturgy, to art, to the environment. I think that's what we had in mind. Mm. Oh, that's wonderful, because that leads me on to, you, you spent some time at the College of Resurrection, I understand, mm. in industrial Yorkshire, and then... Um, Charles Gore uh, was was the founder, wasn't he? Around mm -hmm. with um, ideas of, of Christian socialism. Yes, and is that going on at the same time as you becoming a friend with Kenneth Leach. I got to know Ken a bit in my twenties, but we, I suppose, we worked most together in my thirties. A bit later, no, at, at Murfield, I guess one, two big influences. One would be. Obviously, the legacy of Trevor Huddleston, who'd been a member of the community, and the Murfield community had been very active in resisting apartheid in South Africa, and that was, you know, that was in the water there. <laughs> um, and the other thing was the importance of um, one of the members of the community, who had died, I think, in 1919, John Neville Figgis, um, who who had started out as a Cambridge Don, um, a philosopher of history and had in the early years of the 20th century, having become a member of the Murfield community, written these extraordinary books, collections of essays and sermons and lectures, essentially about um, the nature of political community and Christian community, the nature of, of society as what he called a community of communities, where instead of, again, instead of thinking of the polarization between top-down authoritarianism and naked individualism, said, so, well, actually, you know, human society falls naturally into clusters of interest and mutuality. Society builds up like cells building up in a body through these clusters, which, you know, work together with one another, need some, um, they need someone to hold the ring and kind of massage their relationships from time to time, the state comes in not as a power in itself, but as that which helps those clusters of natural engagement and solidarity work together rather than against each other. And Figgis famously said, that is what we learn from, again, the language of the body of Christ. That is how things work in this human community, which God calls into being. Now, you can't be that kind of person in the church and another kind of person in society. You've somehow got to find how a society could work in that communal, syndicalist, cooperative way. And likewise, you can't be a cooperativist and syndicalist in your politics 
and an autocrat in church. So um, you, you can see the connection, I think, with with Lossky and some of the Russian tradition, and possibly mm. also with the cooperative tradition of Welsh nonconformity <laughs> coming through. So Figgis is somebody who's quite critical of um, both establishmentarian Anglicanism and of um, what you might call mere social gospel Christianity. Um, you know, ju justice and peace in their own right. No, no, you've got, you've got to locate it theologically. You've got to understand what, what a healthy working community looks like. So, you know, figures as part of the Murfield legacy. Yeah. Right. Mm. Yes. So, gosh, so many um, threads like we could pull here. Um, if I can circle back to Trevor Huddleston, mm. his, his name has been mentioned and obviously his inspiration to uh, mm. you know, Kenneth Leach and then your relationship with Kenneth, who was, I understand, the rector of Bethnal Green uh -huh. and campaign against youth homelessness. And there's the Centerpoint Charity, uh, the Running Meat yes. Trust, uh -huh. and then um, and then you forming uh, with others, the Jubilee Group. This is this is this. I, I can see all the can he imagine these things coming to life as the manifestation of these life-giving relationships, conversations, and theological influences and, and personal social actions that people are taking. And this is happening in a time in London of a, of a move of anti-racism, if I can mm -hmm. use that word, because I know it's, it's current today and in the moment. It's interesting, in, in, in planning the interview for today, wanted to ask about that sort of anti-racist moment that you were involved in or could observe. So I wondered if actually now with what's been happening the last couple of weeks, if you could map that, what was going on, anything there that you think might inform the, the, this anti-racism moment that's taking place today. Mm -hmm. I'm very glad you've picked up that dimension of Ken Leach's work because not everybody remembers his time at the Runnymede Trust, but it was a vastly important period for, for him, I think, and for and for others. And it came out of his own experience as a parish priest in the East End, dealing with um, the beginnings, well, not the beginnings exactly, but the particular expression at that time of um, what we now call BNP prejudice. Um, Lots of violence against immigrants and black people. Lots of um, you know, deep-rooted, inherited, old-style British working-class racial prejudice. Not just working-class, but you know, that's where it came through in, in the East End. And Ken, as somebody deeply devoted to the, the local people of the East End and deeply devoted also to migrant and other ethnic communities, really trying to to interpret them to each other, to hold them together, to give them common cause. That's part of what he did in, in his parochial ministry, and it's certainly what he wanted to do in the Runnymede Trust. And he, he was among those who really pressed quite hard for the Church of England to recognize its, its laziness on the subject of race. And out of, out of that, indirectly, came a proposal which I had a bit to do with, in the, I suppose, in the 80s, when I was for a while chair of the Committee for Theological Education in the Church of England. And we'd been challenged by Ken and others to think about the continuing, still true today, imbalance of the visibility of black and minority ethnic people in the ministry of the church. What could we do? And the suggestion came to have a theological institute which would focus on the needs, the experience, the language of people from minority ethnic communities, the Simon of Cyrene Theological Institute. And I remember the, the Committee of Theological Education looking at the plans for this, um, working with those more directly involved to try and find leadership for it. I remember a meeting in the, I think, in the vicarage in Brixton at a time when Brixton was really um, scarred by racial violence, talking about what, what it would take to get this going. And eventually it did happen. I think its promise was not really fulfilled, but it wouldn't have happened without pressure from people like Ken. Right. Mm. And 
and it may be very, very premature, but in terms of what is manifesting, emerging, taking shape with various undercurrents and antecedents and future trajectories, mm. is there anything from that time you think would help us navigate this, this cultural moment that we're in now? Mm. Well, nothing very new that comes to mind that we haven't heard before. That's the sad thing. People often talk about the way in which this subject just keeps going round. But what we, what we were urged to think about in terms of the Simon Cyrene Institute was the obvious point. There are people whose experience is not being named and articulated in the church and taken seriously. And the first thing you can helpfully do very often in such an encounter is to shut up. To give somebody the space to say what needs saying. Um, don't tell them what they need. Don't tell them what they think. Don't tell them how bad you feel about it, even. <laughs> Just give them the room. And there are moments now when I feel, yeah, we can, we can get a bit stuck in telling everybody how bad we feel about it. And I can remember a wonderful... Um, example at a conference I was at about 30 years ago on, um, I suppose, yes, it was the church and capitalism, and somebody saying, you know, the good news for the poor is not that the rich feel awful about it. And similarly, I think in the racial context, the good news for black and minority ethnic communities is not that white people feel terrible. Um, White people, yeah, by all means feel terrible, but then what do you do? What changes? How do you listen? How do you, how do you make space? And you know, in that moment of listening, you will hear a lot of uncomfortable things and possibly some unreasonable or even untrue things, but you'll be hearing what people are seeing, you're hearing where people are. And as with any moment where a silenced or oppressed group first comes to the fore, you really have to bite your tongue and not jump in and say, well, I don't think that's quite fair. Or I don't think that's quite right. Just, you know, just shut up. Let, let this happen. Let it come out because the, the power imbalance is so enormous that you just have to let that, that space emerge where people can say the things that they have to. And then you, then you try to work together. Mm. Mm. So profound. Thank you very much. I mean, as a, as a pastor embedded in the community, it's one of the things I'm wrestling with. How do you not make things worse? And get, to, <sighs> get in the way of this. Um, that's just just immensely helpful. Thank you. Thank you. It, it is a continuing challenge of the church. And I do worry sometimes that, you know, we talk about black majority churches and black led churches. Most of us have not yet found ways of really sustaining a helpful conversation relationship with those churches, we in sort of white-led and white-majority churches. And when I was Archbishop, that was one of the things that really preoccupied me. I used to try and get leaders of these churches to, to Lambeth Palace from time to time for a bit of a kind of brainstorm. But there's so much work still to be done, and we haven't yet found that structure, because I think, to some extent, However hard you try, many of the institutions of authority are not really trusted. So mm. keep working. Oh, thank you. Well, we're getting uh, close to the end and closer to you becoming Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, <laughs> so after a series of prestigious academic appointments at Cambridge and Oxford, you chose to return to Wales mm. as the Bishop of Monmouth mm. and then concurrently the Archbishop of Wales. I suppose I wanted to ask you that question about the interplay between academic life, theology, and the pastoral life of a priest. I see, you know, see both, obviously, at work in you. I see a, mm -hmm. a priest's, minister's, pastor's heart for community and the people, and then this intense academic uh, rich life. And, I, and I'm not projecting myself onto you, but I, I know with many of my friends in ministry they feel the same that you know to one can be the distraction to the other or you really have to lean into one over the other but i see you make this move so what what's that before i ask you why you went there or, or you can speak to that directly but it's more 
are you what's that tension like for you is it a tension that interplay as you've moved between these mm. two worlds yes it is a bit um inevitably and i recognize that there are styles of academic and intellectual work that i've not really been able to undertake because i've I've had a, a bit of dual nationality on this, and equally, styles of involvement and engagement in pastoral ministry that I've not been able to do because of the other things. So there are, yeah, there are losses on both side, sides. I think there's also for me been a steady enrichment, which I would not have been without. I, I could not, I think, have just said, well, I'm just going for the pastoral, I'm just going for the academic, partly because of that sense which I've tried to describe of theology itself being always about the nature of human transformation, the vision you have for human destiny. So it's as if without the theology, there wouldn't be a sort of motor in the engine for involvement. Without the involvement, without trying to think through things like the Simon Sarini Institute or um, other initiatives. Without that, the theology would just not be doing what it's meant to do. So, so yes, attention, but um, not one that I felt crushing. But I suppose when the possibility came up of moving back to Wales as a bishop, I was aware that I'd had, I think by that time, six years in, yes, a fairly um, academic position which I loved and had wonderful research students lovely colleagues we were very very happy and at the same time a little bit of a, an itch feeling well maybe I need to see how this can be put to work in another context now and to be invited back to Wales was felt a little huge privilege and gift going back to my roots and rediscovering that and also to work in, in a non-established church, um, to work in a slightly battered bit of Southeast Wales with lots of social challenges. I thought, well, let's, let's see. I think this probably is a, a prompt from the Lord. So we went back to Wales. I think my wife was not nearly as convinced as I was about this but um, would now agree without any qualification that that was the best time of our lives. <laughs> oh, gosh, how wonderful. I, yes, I was going to ask if it wasn't too impertinent, what was the effect upon your family in, in making that move back to, to Wales? Well, we, at that time, we only had one daughter. She was still very young, so it wasn't too bad a, an uprooting. So she, she was able to start school in Wales to grow up over the nearly 11 years we spent in Wales, um, very much a part of the, the community, local community in inner city Newport. So I'm hearing there, if I can put words into your mouth, you, you used a, a metaphor then of a car um, and yeah. parts that, that, that pastoral life fueled your theological uh, mm -hmm. life and, and vice versa, that one, there was a, there would be a poor, I would, it sounds like there would be a paucity to to your life if you didn't have both these aspects working together. Exactly. Yes, yes, yes. And as, as I said, in, in a smallish church like the Church in Wales and a smallish diocese, the great thing is you do get to know people. And I, I'd wanted to be as hands-on as I could as a bishop and to be out in the parishes as much as I could. And that was what gave me the most joy and built up friendships that have lasted to this day. Oh, how precious. I know the preciousness of community life, uh, mm -hmm. parish life. So then, uh, 2002, you mm -hmm. uh, became Archbishop of Canterbury, and a lot's been written about that. Um, uh, and if I can focus in on a couple of questions, what, what were you able to incorporate into that role at that point from your social theology i'm asking because again the focus of this interview is i know there's so many people i can't imagine the immensity of the moving parts that you had to deal with in stakeholders and constituencies but what was it like for you in that role were you able to instantiate 
your social theology in ways that you found meaningful mm. and fulfilling. Does that question make sense? I think so. Thank you. It was a, it was a bit difficult because as Archbishop, you however hard you try, you can't be hands-on in quite the way you can in a, a diocese of a hundred and odd parishes. Um, and I did feel that frustrating. I thought that part of my my job would be to do some public reflection and that part of the role of the Archbishop ought to be thinking out loud in public about the kind of society we were. Hence, um, before I actually took up office, I'd been appointed doing the Dimbleby Lecture in, um, in December of 2002, I think, looking at aspects of the market state and what what a healthy society might need if it wasn't to be consumed by the market. And that kind of reflection, I suppose I kept up fairly regularly through my time as Archbishop, reflected in the, um, the book of Essays, Faith in the Public Square, which is um, an assortment of the sorts of reflection on public affairs that I was invited to undertake. And um, the rather controversial moment when I was guest editor of the New Statesman, I think in 2011, um, and made some slightly tactless remarks about the coalition government. <laughs> but, um, I, I saw that as, as being in the same the same trajectory. So that was one thing, the, um, the actual public reflection. But see previous remarks, you can't do public reflection without a certain amount of um, face-to-face -face engagement. And one of the challenges was making sure that I, I got myself enough opportunity to see and hear on site, face-to-face, -face, some of what's going on. I, I did quite a lot of school visits in London and elsewhere, tried to be around in, in Canterbury fairly regularly in the diocese and in the city, got involved with um, a couple of projects with the homeless in Canterbury City itself, um, and also tried to develop a little bit the profile of the church in um, international development, putting together the Anglican Alliance, the global network of Anglican groups that were working in aid and development. And that took up a fair bit of time in my last three or four years in office. But I think it's one of the things I look back on with most gratitude, helping that to happen. So there, there were also issues about, if you like, connecting issues around global poverty with issues about poverty or inequity on our own doorstep, which would go away in a hurry. So when I stepped down as Archbishop and was invited to take on the chair of Christian Aid, that did seem a fairly natural progression from some of what had preoccupied me. And one of the things we, we tried to say um, at Lambeth in my time was that if I'd done a visit to a particular church overseas, if I'd been to Central Africa or um, Melanesia or Pakistan, what, what was going to happen when I got back? What kind of difference <clears throat> might the visit make? Could we try and identify some way of specifically helping, advocating for, supporting issues that we'd seen on the ground? And um, that, that was a helpful challenge, you know, coming back and saying, well, we don't just write thank you letters and um, put the photographs into an album. We now say, so what, out of all that, was there something that really came into focus for us that we could be useful with? I don't think we always got it right. I don't think we always managed it, but it was just a question that was important to have on the radar. Mm. I know uh, all my pastor ministry friends over three decades now end up in different uh, denominations, church tribes, and they feel, I know in different ways for different reasons, they all face the similar challenges of navigating private public faith dynamics. And you, you've already answered the next question I was going to ask, what were, what were like many of my friends they discover things that keep them going in the midst of that complexity that are life-giving and rich to them and those were so those those are, are any other ones that i could well, if you certainly to... visits to parishes in in canterbury diocese were wonderful and also um for i think practically the whole of my 10 years in lambeth and for a couple of years afterwards I would be regularly corresponding with children in a primary school in East Manchester. One of the children wrote to me 
um, in about 2004, I think, to say uh, I'm in year six in this church school in Beswick in East Manchester. Um, and the head teacher has encouraged me to write you a letter about what happens here. So she wrote, I wrote back and um, well, for the next 12 years, I used to have about a letter a month from somebody in the school and I would write back and we'd keep corresponding through the year. And every year somebody would be sort of identified as, you know, you're going to be writing letters to Rowan this year. <laughs> and I visited the school several times. I used to get the kids up to, to London for a, a picnic in Lambeth Palace Gardens once a year. And that was an absolute life giver. And gave me some insight about life in a you know quite tough area of East Manchester. And it's the kind of thing also which you can sometimes bring into public debate. I can remember talking about, about this in the House of Lords on one occasion when um, the proposal was on the table for licensing a super casino in East Manchester. And uh, I got up and said, well, yeah, actually, my lords, <laughs> you know a little bit about East Manchester. And if you think that super casinos in East Manchester is a way of you know, reviving local economy or local community, then I do not know what planet you're living on. On that happy occasion, the government was soundly defeated. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. What a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful anecdote and very moving. Thank you. Um, and now since being Archbishop, you've now moved back into academic life as you've been Master of uh, Magdalen College uh, in Cambridge. Um, and we've talked about Conrad Knoll and the, the, the talk that you gave there. Um, so, uh, seeing you press back into those aspects which you can do uh, free from your previous role as, as Archbishop. Um, what at this between leaving uh, being Archbishop and, and going back to Magdalen College, were, were there any more things of your Christian socialism that you have been pressing into these last few years? Practically speaking, um, <clears throat> A couple of issues in, in the city locally. One uh, has been the food bank, of which I'm a, a patron, and I've done a certain amount of advocacy and so forth for that. And then um, another local charity I've been very much involved with um, is to do with a safe house for young women who are at risk. Um, and a number of people in the college <clears throat> happily have kind of joined in that and helped to support at a rather difficult time for this this place. So there have been some engagements like that. Um, at the more theoretical level, I suppose two things that have really struck me as needing thought. One is what what do we make of the whole notion of human rights these days? We've got into a a very contentious, rather forensic, claims-oriented picture of human rights, which is almost divided from the notion of what makes a, a good society, strangely. Um, I don't think you can have a good society without a concept of human rights, but you can't build a good society just on a notion of rights. So how do you build that bridge? And um, I guess also I've been interested in this is around the definition and the strains of democracy. What, what do we really mean by democracy? Has theology anything to say into that? So in rather loose and informal ways, those, those are issues that have been around for me in my thinking. What does theology have to say into debates about rights and democracy? Oh, well, right. Thank you. We've been going a very long time. And if I can still pressing, I have the wonderful opportunity to ask you, my PhD is, is behind me. But as I, I want to finish, if I can, with some cheeky questions that touch into my own research interests and intersect with notions of Christian socialism, which I would, you know, to friends who you know, obviously hear the word socialism and, and, and it triggers the wrong things. Uh -huh. but, but I would talk about, you know, the, what are the social limits to a capitalist society what are the what are the communitarian community aspects that we we lose with an unfettered capitalism and there, and there is with an anglican 
uh, social theology with all I think all good Christian theology uh, a, a vision and an opportunity to, to set limits and temper the worst but enable the best and, and I know you I think at some point in the past you talked about an aggressive sort of individualism um, mm. at work and and through this interview we, we, we've talked about isolation and anomic conditions through through society and, and the problems now my, my if, if you could bear with me my part of my academic work was looking at how commodification operationalizes and instantiates social imaginaries of, of consumer culture as habits and practices and also how it co-ops even Christian imagination. Mm -hmm. and I come from a, an evangelical tradition so so to put it crudely I, I was trying to figure out why why does proof of the activity of God result in, in material provision? Um, most evangelicals again I'm talking for my tribe I put it crudely this way from my research. If I said to them, your jobs, homes and relationships, the fundamental currency of every, uh, the Christian imagination for evangelicals would be it. Those things are supposed to be used in service of the mission of Jesus and the kingdom of God. They would all say yes, but in everyday life, it's the other way around. Jesus is the, is the religious dispenser of those aspects for life and I was trying to uh, make an account of that and I dug into lots of Anglo-Catholic sources to help me understand some of what was happening um, mm. Vincent Miller, William Kavanagh and others were immensely helpful but as I was reading those works they sort of got I got quite despondent because all of them make wonderful diagnoses but sort of all at the end say well despite that diagnosis you know and often would point to the Eucharist and and some of the things we talked about today mm. there would be sort of this resigned well, actually, the, the the perverting forces of commodification are such that, you know, liturgical arrangements, we've touched on liturgy today, you know, they might be able to sort of, I would use this, I would use this language, might be able to compete those forces. Mm. Uh, and it's, it's quite unsatisfactory to get to the point of where liturgy becomes just about competing curriculums that mm. might mm. recolonize or overcolonize what's taking place. Mm. Uh, and, and underneath all of that, I landed in a place thinking, what is it about Christian worship where God might join himself to it in the liturgical that it doesn't just trump corrosive imaginations of, from commodification, but generates by the spirit a way of life yeah. that would be immensely, so immensely attractive, you wouldn't want to go back to that. Does that make any sense? Absolutely. I guess yes. I'm asking you what hope, I know you would understand all of that as I've said it, but what hope do you have for liturgy and Christian worship yeah. in the face of, of what's taking place? I very much like the phrase that's used by one or two 20th century Russian Orthodox writers, the liturgy after the liturgy. Now, you, you don't just talk about liturgy as what happens in church. You talk about liturgy as the way in which you create significant meaning-bearing patterns of relation and action in the world at large. Liturgy gives you the shape and the energy for this, but it's got to be outside the church. Or, um, Mother Maria Skobtsova, the great... Um, Russian nun in Paris who worked with refugees and eventually was killed by the Nazis because of her work with the Jews. She used to talk about this and led a very unconventional nunnish life, trying to do the liturgy after the liturgy, particularly in relation to um, refugees and eventually Jewish refugees in Paris. So it's, again, it's an inseparable vision. If this is what, if, if you mean what you say about the humanity that is shown forth in liturgical action and spoken of and sung about, if that's what you believe about human beings, well, what are the transformations needed? What are the policies needed once you step outside that directly liturgical framework to make the society you're in, um, not liturgical in a narrow sense, but compatible with what you're saying? So that sense of I've written a bit about this here and there, the need for a society where we take more time with each other, the sense that there are certain goods and realities which we have to grow into and mustn't be hurried and mustn't be packaged and therefore commodified too quickly, the sense of the 
mysteriousness that we face, the sense that we are all of us together facing into the same mystery, so that none of us has um, leverage and advantage. You know, that says something about, back to Losky again, the reverence for the utter uniqueness and the mysteriousness of everybody we encounter. Um, and that basic, basic, acted image in the church, we are fed by the same bread. And nobody gets more or less. We are, we are there on the same footing, all of us invited. Now, what does a society look like where everybody is able to feel that they're invited and wanted, that they're guests? Naked capitalism does not deliver that. It really does not deliver that. It delivers a system in which, however you try and modify it and soften it, the logic is that certain people are allowed to fall off the edge and need to fall off the edge. And that's why a Christian always has to have that critical edge in thinking about and speaking about capitalism. We're not going to overthrow the system tomorrow. But the sort of question we have to be asking is, how do we create a society where people are not permitted to be forgotten and fall off the edge? And that does mean reining in an unbridled, unprincipled capitalism. We see it, of course, in relation to the environment as well as to human beings, because the environment has fallen off the edge. In a sense, that's been one of the most dramatic victims of an unbridled, competitive capitalist economy. So while you can say, okay, there's nothing evil about wealth creation as such, and yeah, we haven't yet found a completely successful way of running a a socialist economy, all right, but let's take the time to identify where the heaviest cost falls, where the differences can be made, and let's keep before us a vision of that society where people do not fall out of view. Yeah. Mm. Well, that uh, my last question um, is going to be about the opportunities at the moment in the pandemic, uh, which you're already um, you're already pointing us to but if I can ask one prior question to it there is the moment we start to talk about bring the realms of let's say theology and economics together there's there's a strong disdain for each other so <laughs> as you know so econ <laughs> economists you know think that they have they have the fundamental understanding of of, of the universe and a reality that theology can pontificate all it wants about but there is the danger as you know that theology can disdain the economic economic i i sometimes found myself doing some of my own readings people like oh, sorry i shouldn't name anyone um I, I had a business background for 10 years working in the city of london uh, in a previous life and i'm like the, the level of naivety of some theologians who do not understand the basic mechanisms of economics so seeing that tension uh, between them so i guess i'm asking a, a, a first order question before we get to the very last one of how do we in this moment with what's taking place not recapitulate this ivory tower theology and pragmatic economics how what's the opportunity for them to come into conversation mm. with, with, without falling prey to that problem mm. it's possibly worth saying that there's such a thing as ivory tower economics as well and that one, one of the things which a theologian might reasonably say about economics in the last couple of decades is, in what exact sense are you telling me this is more realistic than what we're talking about? <laughs> I felt that very strongly in 2008 with the, uh, the financial crisis that we were being invited to, to tolerate um, what some people would call the worst kind of theological fantasy about how money and profit worked. So I would want to push back just a bit on yeah. <laughs> pragmatic economics. But yes, of course you're right. And of course, I'm very conscious myself when I'm in, involved in debates about this, that I'm not an economist. I haven't got the training. Um, and therefore, the question I'd come with is not, how can I solve your economic problems for you? But how can I engage so as to, so as to bring front and center the question of how economics becomes in the proper way, a, a humanistic discipline, a discipline about people in all their dimensions. Because economic rationality, as we all know, doesn't in fact work in the way that the textbooks say. 
more and more economists are factoring in what used to be called externalities in their thoughts about the nature of profit. The whole environmental cost has suddenly become an issue that economists pay attention to. And um, writers like Michael Sandel have very powerfully raised the question of, so what is it that cannot be commodified here? And what questions does that put? So I think the theologian can helpfully bring some of those questions to bear, and, um, and some do. Carl Polanyi is a, is a bit hmm. of an influence to me for understanding the role of imagination yeah. uh, for markets. They're not self-regulating in a, you know, human constructions that require legal underwriting and the, the, the imaginative will to perpetuate them. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm old enough to remember sitting in front of a video. I worked for NatWest Bank in my gap year, and watched a government video telling me the benefits of leaving my company scheme with the bank to mm-hmm. take out a personal pension. Fast forward later in life, uh, as a as an independent financial advisor in uh, London that I was doing. It was ironic to watch how then any any financial advisor who promoted this government policy was 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 then being you know disdained uh, in the press and the media for having done something oh, oh. terrible, um, and and that and then I'm watching the unfolding uh, as we came into the economic uh, crash and crisis of people saying, but why are people having that discovery? Why why aren't markets rational? Mm, realization mm. that human beings underpin them with capriciousness around imaginations and policies and and changes and and suddenly there there is a space it felt like there was a space to go well human beings fund we have an understanding as christians human beings fundamentally are bent towards themselves i remember as a financial advisor if something was not regulated human beings would always find a way to take advantage of it for self-interest uh-huh. that, that that's a factor so anyway all that said rowan coming around to land on this final question here for you with what's taking place in the pandemic with seeing a level of questioning that people i'm noticing again it's only anecdotally but people saying i'm not sure i want things to go back to the way they were before there seems to be this uh, re- sort of waking up from what's held people captive for their imagination and practices in, in all of those aspects and more is there feels like there is just this immense opportunity for christians broadly but certainly social theology be prescient of this moment and offer and say there is a different way to live yes there there is what what if i can we can finish there today Mm. what what would you speak into that place if you had the chance for everyone in the uk to hear (laughs) (laughs) well i'd say hold up the mirror to yourselves in the last few weeks last couple of months we have not actually descended into social chaos we have corporately been ready to bear a certain amount of cost for vulnerable people that we don't know and haven't met. We've put up with isolation and distancing, not just for our own safety, but for the safety of others. And we have recognized more and more dramatically how much we owe to the underpaid and under-recognized people who simply keep the wheels turning for us. We also, to some extent, recovered um, an awareness of a natural world that our haste and polluted environment often doesn't help us, doesn't allow us to to see. I want to say, hold up that mirror, look at what you found valuable, look at what you have found doable and imaginable at this period. We can change, we can live differently. And don't forget what mattered to you in this period, because if it mattered to you in this period, it really matters. And I would like to see in the next 12 months or so a political discourse shaping up, which, if you like, grows out of those recognitions. We acted with a degree of altruism. We acted with a degree of recognition of the least well rewarded and recognize how badly rewarded they were. We acted with a degree of gratitude and appreciation of uncluttering our lives. So, as the Americans like to say, go figure. What political consequences might follow from that? Yes. Oh, 
what a stunning place to finish. Thank you so much, Rowan. Thank you for uh, for being honest and warm and open as I knew you would be. Um, and again, if I can just be personal here, having been inspired by some of your work, but you as a person um, and uh, and the, the the roles that you have played and that that priest theologian it's, it's a role i aspire to so thank you for the inspiration there and thank you for your care and the love that's generated with the that you have done um, thank you it's not that's not incredibly generous of you and thank you thank you so much but it's been it's been a joy talking with you and uh, discovering you too and thank you for the chance of this conversation we hope you enjoyed that and we have many other interviews with amazing guests where we listen attentively and respectfully to discover people's backstories through their beliefs and life experiences and find out what shaped them into who they are and inspires what they do. You can catch all those interviews by liking and subscribing to our YouTube channel. You can find audio versions in your podcast platform of choice, Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, SoundCloud, Stitcher, etc. Just search Extra ECC. Of course, you can go to extraecc.com and sign up for our newsletter and find all our social media links and more. And by the way, all links are in our show notes below. Mm -hmm.